So I'm going to ask a couple of little questions that I hope will prompt an exchange. And Malcolm, maybe I'll stay with you because you invoke that tremendous vision of what life's really about there um, with the sense of I am and the imagination which is the incarnation happening now. But Barfield, I think, also felt that romanticism must come of age, as he put it. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons why he was so amazed to find Steiner, because he felt that Steiner knew what you have shown us just now, but was able to, to develop it into well, what he called a science, but in the German sense of a kind of new ecology of spiritual awareness, you might say. So I want to put it to you. What does this sense that now romanticism must come of age mean? Yeah, I, in fact, Barfield wrote a book called Romanticism Comes of Age. And um, I think if you look back historically at the Romantics, there is a recovery and a rediscovery of this inner being, which is wonderful. However, <laughs> there is also an extraordinary cult of the individual and the ego and the imagination turning in on itself and the romantic idea of the sort of lonely genius and the sort of peculiar person thinking peculiar pe things in some heroic rocky place and with the sort of senses of the Beethovens and the Napoleons and the Byrons. And I think some of the romantics, including Coleridge, perceived that there was a danger that these discoveries, which are actually the discoveries of something that wells up into every mind and is available to every person and is capable of transforming, were sort of, I mean, to, to use a word avant la lettre, were sort of privatized and, and, and used to fuel sort of rock star egos among, among, among early romantics, and that, that was a danger. So there was an immaturity there. That's one sense in which romanticism had to come of age, that it had to um, be mature enough to have a humility towards its material and a compassion towards everybody else. And that still needs to happen. A lot of the peculiarities and dead ends of modern art are to do with the idea that it is self-expression in the worst possible sense of that, uh, that term, that it is just the kind of excretion of the, of the privileged ego rather than the expression of the great self that we all share. <laughs> so, 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 so I think there's that. I think the other thing that Barfield wanted, in a way, romanticism come of age, he would almost, he perhaps couldn't get away with it. He's wanting to say Christianity come of age too. He was actually wanting to say, is there something in this great story that we've been keeping, as it were, of a logos which makes everything and then which individuates down into a single person and is made flesh, but then that single person actually says, everything I'm doing, you can do, uh, you know, everything, you know and, and actually breathes, you know, the first part of the narrative says that that person Christ comes into the world because the Holy Spirit comes upon Mary and the Spirit falls upon him. But the first thing that Christ does when he rises from the dead is breathe on everybody and say, receive the Spirit. I think Barfield thought there was a bit of a, par a parallel there, that just as um, there was a danger that the Romantics created a kind of unfortunate meritocracy and a, a privileged few who got it, um, there was a danger that Christianity was doing the same thing and turning, you know, you know, creating a new law and a new set of good works rather than that beautiful thing that, I mean, Barfield often commented on the great conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, partly because he was interested in the word pneuma, meaning wind and spirit and breath and why they all meant the same thing. But it, the interesting thing about that conversation is uh, Nicodemus wants to get Jesus to kind of nail it down and pass it on to him as a sort of a little intellectual possession for himself. And Jesus won't do that. And Jesus says the famous thing, you know, ye, the wind bloweth, ye hear the sound thereof, ye know not whence it cometh or whither it goeth, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. You must be born free of spirit and water. It's a very different thing from what... Interestingly, Barfield points out that since it's the same word in Greek, pneuma, for when they have Jesus talk about the wind, and it's exactly the same word, pneuma, when he's talking about the spirit, Jesus could easily have meant, or could perhaps we should hear him saying, the spirit, you, the spirit blows wherever it likes, and you hear the sound thereof and you don't know where it comes from and you don't know where it goes and so it is with all of us who were born before the wind 
You know, there's no reason why it shouldn't be that way around. So I think the coming of age is actually to do with a kind of setting aside of ego and humility. And that's very sharp because I think he's pushing back against Kant and sort of dare to know. And the sense that the Enlightenment had that we have now reached full maturity, you know, we're, 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 we're now the mature thinkers. And they referred to indigenous peoples as childish or childlike. Lewis had it much better when Lewis said, when I was a child, I, I thought like a child. When I became a man, I put childish things away. And the first thing I put away was the fear of being thought childish. You know, a really mature person can be as childlike as they like. Sorry, I've gone on too long. Would anyone else like to pick things up or I'm happy to prompt further thoughts? Okay, well, I'm going to ask Jessica something then from what she was saying because I hope this is related to where Malcolm was just going there, that I half heard you say perhaps that in the spiritual practice that you know, part of what happens is that, as it were, you move to an edge of your own sense of your inner life and discover a much bigger inner life within you and around you perhaps even. When you talked about the Taoist practices that cultivate a new sense of spiritual self or spiritual being. Now I wonder, does that link in with anything that we're talking about? Do you recognize that? Is that part of what the imagination is about? It's almost like seeing more than we normally see when we can understand uh, the limits of our perceptions, uh, the limits of ourselves, so that our self maybe, as Malcolm was just saying, falls into service um, with a wider whole, a wider perception. Yes, I think that's exactly right. Um, I think the, the interesting thing to me about those practices is that it's, it's sort of training. Um, whereas in some ways, the way that we talk about the imagination and even Coleridge, actually, who was pretty scientific about it. Oh, very, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, it, it, seems, it, it seems more, you know, more rigorous even than that. This, this is how you do it. But I think the end point is exactly the same. Um, and I think that was a great way of explaining it, actually. I, the I am thing is incredible, actually. If you really think about it, it turns the whole world upside down, doesn't it? It does, yeah. It's a different place to think from. Yeah. I mean, I think in some ways, you know, the, these, these sort of stringent spiritual practices, that is their purpose, to understand how big you are, but also how connected you are, and how everything works because of that connection. I mean, there's one lovely Taoist practice called Walking the Seven Stars, and, you know, boy, if you want to understand what the mandate of heaven is, um, that's the you know that's one of the ways to do it. You 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 suddenly see the whole order of of nature and of cos the cosmos, um, and you're very small part in it. That's nonetheless incredibly important. And I think that's sort of what you were talking about. Thank you, Simon. I want to put a similar question to you, but maybe asking you to reflect on the future of evolution, which you know you are one of the seminal figures in uh, the development of evolutionary theory. Um, and I wonder whether you can link it to the sense we've had this morning of how the imagination, as a way, is the future, which we're just beginning to perceive. How do you see evolution developing? What's your glimpse there? And maybe what's your sense of how language might play a key part in that? So that, again, this notion um, that romanticism might come of age. It was, at the f it's, it was in some of the founding figures in, in evolutionary theory, but maybe there's something that we can begin to glimpse and that you particularly, because you are completely immersed in this, uh, begin to glimpse and that you could speculate for us now. Well, I, I can answer that extremely quickly. I haven't got the foggiest idea. <laughs> Do you know, I don't actually believe you. <laughs> well, that's not meant to be an unkind response either. Uh, I'm fascinated by the, by the possibilities. Um, I think, and, and again, Malcolm's read all the inklings. I've only read some of them. He'll correct me immediately. I think it's true that Lewis, of all of them, had the greatest interest in what we would call traditional science fiction. Uh, and I have some interest in that as well, for various reasons. Um, and I think he was also quite interested in what Arthur C. Clarke wrote at one was, stage. Yeah. yeah. And he wrote this famous uh, novella, really, Childhood's End, which I must reread. Uh, and I think, in a sense, Clark, in his own way, was sort of intuiting, which was already being mentioned in passing by, I think, everybody else, that there's 
well, uh, Tyard talked about this in another context. Let's not go there. These honest people have come to hear about Barfield. Um, but it's okay, please do. No, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not there to speak yeah. about, about uh, Tyard particularly, but the sense that there is some point of culmination. And, of course, part of the problem is, and again, that was hinted at in a practice of which I know nothing, Taoism, uh, with regard to what timelessness might be, if I understood you correctly. Uh, and we've all experienced that in different ways. Oh, boy, have we. Um, the one thing I would say, though, um, is that um, there are alternative paths, uh, both individually and without sounding as if I'm a priest, which I'm not, uh, and things can go very badly wrong indeed, disastrously so. Uh, there are actually some very interesting science fiction stories in that context as well, and of course, if in doubt, there's always that chap called Screwtape. He seems to know a great deal as well. Uh, and in that way, I'm not sanguine that, you know, just because we're nice and all the rest of it, and because we understand the logos, well, not understand, but echoing, oh, sorry, what uh, Malcolm was saying. I'm cautiously optimistic myself, um, but it is that, 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 how better can I put it, that one feels in a sense of transcendence. And all I would say otherwise, and this is another of my pet interests, and again, as I see several people already getting the tube, yes, just uh, as I also have an interest in the paranormal, uh, and that's not probably so unusual in this gathering here. Uh, and I don't want to make a scientific study of it, um, but it seems to me that's telling us something extremely important about what we're not, rather than what we want to be. Um, and that is actually full of threats as well, as it so happens. So the simple answer is that I have no idea at all, but one can take a very, very bleak view, as I think was hinted at a moment ago, with regard to the erosion of language. Uh, and I'm no poet at all, but um, there, is a, there is, I think, serious concerns in the fact that, uh, especially the Orwellian dystopias are coming back into conversation, hint that you know, people are extremely uneasy about some paths being taken at the moment. And they feel, I think, effectively powerless by and large, and I won't go off into any other rants about populism and so forth, uh, just except to remind you that there was a previous Prime Minister, and I shall try and imitate his voice, mm -hmm. who said, we did a go here, trust the people, trust the people. He's on telly at the moment, that Prime Minister. <laughs> what? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we're not, just say a little bit more about that, paranormal and what we're not. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I think there's a, a, there are huge areas of human experience which under the materialist agendas have been derided. And the very large majority of people, I suspect, will, as I was talking to Jim uh, earlier on, uh, have had one or two things which have happened to them, but they've been shelved. And you, you can't get much traction on these things, but if you remain open to them, and if you don't allow your language to be polluted, then you can reintroduce these concepts, not as a source of power. You can get that. It's bloody dangerous, I can tell you, on authority. Um, but there's the sense, again, that what we might be it will be something which childhood's end, as an analogy, is something quite beyond our comprehension, which sounds pretty wishy-washy and not the sort of thing we talk about in Cambridge very much, no. Mm. Marilyn, you're nodding a lot of that. Well, I mean, uh, there are sort of huge, uh, a huge range of examples of psychic experience and paranormal events and so on that are proven. The reason why they're not given appropriate study by orthodox science and medicine is they have a subjective element in that only certain people have these powers to actually go out of themselves, out there, and have these psychic experiences um, and, and it's a subjective element that needs to be worked on as if you know somebody who has psychic powers of going out and realizing stuff that's happening you know with remote viewing or telepathy and so on can train others to have the same experience I think that's what needs to happen but I'd also like to say, although I was talking not so much about evolution of consciousness before, I was really talking about the consciousness of evolution, about how consciousness in terms of aware and responsive, interconnected and service and love, how that drives evolution, how it's primary, and with the increasing complexity via service, avoiding extinction, um, that shows that matter is derivative from consciousness. So that's the pan-psychic view. But I've also considered these things from the point of view 
uh, of human consciousness. I've given a few lectures at SMN on um, the evolution of consciousness and also on the science of imagination. There's a huge amount of science proving the power of imagination. It is indisputable that you are what you think, that your imagination uh, fires your neurology and physiology the same as the real thing. And I always give an example. If you're in a dark lane, in a sort of unknown place, alone, late at night, and there's a noise behind you, and you're afraid you're about to be mugged. If you want to know about you know, your physiology and neurology, I mean, within seconds, the pupils dilate, the skin temperature changes, your hair stands on end, your blood goes away from your gut to your muscles, your breathing changes, your heart rate changes. That is a thought, I'm, I'm not safe here. And it's driving your whole being, your whole way that you are in that moment. And it, it's very important. I mean, somebody brought up the idea of the lion rustling at the bottom of the tree. I mean, imagination is a very important aspect to survival in evolution. I mean, if you, you met, it's good to imagine a lion there because if you went off to investigate, you wouldn't have had any progeny, so you wouldn't have survived in evolution. Because, uh, so imagination is a very important um, power to keep you safe. We are what we think. And in terms of that, I mean, in terms of, um, I was thinking in terms of not co consciousness of evolution, but evolution of consciousness, in that, um, I like what Gandhi said, or as Gandhi was paraphrased, be the change that you want to see in the world. That's a paraphrase of what he actually said, which was beautiful. Be the change. But I mean, first of all, before you can change or be the change of what you want to happen, you've got to know who you are, who you are as, a starting, as your starting material. And of course, I'm very involved in that in terms of um, transgenerational inheritance of acquired characteristics, because Lamarckism, was thrown out by the supremacy of the DNA and the central dogma, it was all about genes, because nobody could see how you could inherit acquired characteristics. These are characteristics that your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, and it's gone back four generations now in science, that we can show that ancestral inheritance of gene programming coming through four generations, modifying the actual genes in the sperm and egg, and that you're born that sort of person, one has to realize, before you think about changing, that you're just one of a hundred different possible versions of who you could be. And I always think, oh my goodness, you know, if I were brought up in a uh, Mexican drug cartel, I'd be a different sort of person than being brought up on a horse in a den in Long Ranges riding in Australia. You'd be a different person. And the reason why you are what you are, that one out of a hundred or more, is of all that conditioning, the ancestral inheritance from your ancestors, the um, conditioning of your genes in the womb according to how a mother's experiencing your life, the conditioning of your genes, at the life, the environment you're born into, awful lot of conditioning happens there, um, and, and the conditioning by the role you take on in society. You know, you always ask, why does an actress look like an actress, a waiter looks like a waiter, bishop looks like a bishop, judge looks like a judge. They've taken on a role in service to society and, and they're continuing to program their genes to fit in, you know, as into that uniform of who they've decided to be. So given that, before you think about evolution of consciousness in terms of the human race and where we're heading, We've got to accept where we're coming from and firstly look at all the barriers to change because we're stimulus response machines. The way we pick up a pen, hit a golf ball, sit in a chair, eat your food, eat, et cetera, is all how you did it the first time and it's wired in. The stimulus is to do something, sit in a chair, and you do it that way. That's the response and it's wired in. And so it's a huge barrier to actually change what you do moment by moment in response to stimuli. The stimuli can be actual physical things like hitting a golf ball or brushing your teeth or walking down stairs or playing a violin or how you react to an emotion or, or whatever. That's the stimulus and your response will be habitual. And there's also um, faulty sensory perception in that the way you do it feels right because that's where you've already done it. But it could be really, really wrong. And, and then, of course, you, you can't change who you are because of peer group pressure. They won't let you change. And so, I mean, what I'm talking about now is uh, 
what's come into neuroscience re recently is the concept of free won't. In other words, stimulus, no, and choice of response. Old habitual way, do nothing, do something irrelevant, or with powerful directions for best poised, balanced, present you, choose a response continuing the directions to be the best you you can be in that moment without all your body being contorted by muscular contractions in response to previous stimuli. So what I'm really talking about is, uh, is the training um, that originated with Alexander, um, a practicing Alexander technique, which is to put a hiatus between stimulus and response, and in that pause, re release any unnecessary tension in the body resulting from stimuli to past experiences. And, and to allow postural reflex to come in, so you go up in response to gravity, which makes you open, present, and available to what's happening in the moment, and then choose the response. So, um, yeah, the power of imagination, firing your neurology, your physiology, your life view, the need to change to, to be what we want to see happen in the world for future generations, to actually reprogram our own genes so that we're reprogramming the genes of future generations and stopping that ancestral inheritance. So that's a scientific view of imagination and uh, who we are and who we want to be. So I'd like to have a moment or two in this session for any thoughts uh, from you guys particularly on anything else you'd like teased out, just developed a bit at this stage, not as it were um, a complete response, but the teasing out that we can carry into the afternoon. There are a couple of hands gone up already, which is great. Just would anyone on the panel just like to add a further thought at this stage, or should we see what? Yeah, okay, great. So the microphone, I mean, do you wanna, Richard, do you wanna just sort of find the people this, this hands gone? So this teasing out, maybe we'll take two or three, and then we can get two or three different responses. Thank you. I'm just trying to make connection with what's been said and the idea of the true self and the full self um, and that dichotomy between ego and, and beyond the ego. And also, so just how does that relate to the sense of true self, full self? We talked about true imagination. Uh, is that the sense of true self uh, in that? Also, I'm just wondering how that re relates to some of the words of Richard Rohr around the rational and the transrational as well. So just, just, wait, just trying to hold all these different words and whether that are helpful connections. Thank you. Do raise your hands again and the mic will come to you. I don't know, Richard, if you want to run right to the back even, then we try and cover some other ground at least. Um, thank you. Hi, just a question for Professor Simon Conway Morris. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it, Marilyn. But yes, yeah, so I bought your book, The Shale. And, but I just, um, I'm gobsmacked, to be, be quite frank, about people still questioning, do animals have language? I mean, I think there's a conference coming up in April. You, people need to go to that by the looks of it. But I, I've been studying um, tropical fish um, for a number of years. I've got my own large tank. And, and I joked that to my friends that since I've had this tank, I've turned off East Enders, not that I ever watched it, because it's all happening in my tank. You know, love, sex, uh, manipulation, intrigue. And you know what? I mean, my, they, they live such rich lives when you actually take the time to study. I, I've got angelfish particularly are very interesting. They communicate not only amongst themselves, but um, they're as interested in what's going on outside the tank and communicate, you know, I can wiggle. And there's a lot of communication even across the species. I mean, um, but so they have a number of ways of communicating um, uh, they use sonar, click, click, clicks, and things like that, but also body language, and they have quite structured social conventions, just like we do. They have exactly the same emotions, and I believe language, I mean, how can anybody say uh, either that, it, you know, unless you speak a particular speech as language, or, I mean, it's impossible for anyone to make such a claim that they don't have a language, you know what I mean? But they certainly do. I believe that we're not unique amongst species. Thank you for that. Let's have a third and maybe a fourth point towards the back. Now, there's more hands going up, so we're going to have some frustrated hands. But nonetheless, let's get at least a couple more, and hopefully some of the ground will be covered. Um, this is for the whole panel. Um, I was thinking a lot about, quite often, there's this implied kind of dichotomy going on between imagination and reason. And a lot of people seem to say imagination is seeing the whole, and reason is analytical. It looks at the fine detail. 
And there's often this sense that romanticism may have been a reaction to the Enlightenment. I want to ask, what does it mean for reason to come of age? How will reason change in response to this development in our use of imagination? Often people talk about, by going deeper and deeper into the fine detail, you somehow see the whole with greater clarity. How might we do that? Lovely question, wonderful question. Let's, let's, let's take a fourth, because there was one by you, I think, and then we'll come to that. So I'm very interested in the elasticity of the word I. You have the sense of the big I and the little me. And if you contemplate the use of that word, and you look back at your own life, you can say, well, uh, I was in love with Maureen at the age of 14, and at 16, I absolutely hated her. Um, at 19, I was an evangelical, and 21, I became a Buddhist. So you become aware of this rather um, subjective uh, nature of the word I. So <clears throat> my question is, what is the, relating back to what was just said by one of the speakers, what is the true I, which would then um, perhaps work against the, or would help us understand how romanticism uh, didn't reach that notion of the true I, rather egoism, but uh, something beyond what we normally think of as the I. And so that, that is sort of intriguing as to how one get, can get a sense of who the true I is. Yeah, maybe echoes of service and humility which have come up in the panel as well. Now, Malcolm, I heard you saying good question to reason come of age. Do you want to pick that one up and then I'll feed the back and whoever would like to pick up the thoughts. I, I thought that was a great question about how, how, what does it mean for reason to come of age. Um, yeah, we've got this sort of binary reason imagination going on and a sense that the Enlightenment had overemphasized a certain kind of a kind of reductive re reasoning, a thing, um, anatomization. Mary Midgley, the, the great uh, philosopher in science, talk, called it. Um, but when you go back, so, so, so in that binary, reason gets rather a poor press, you know, from those of us who want to recover the imagination as a truth-bearing faculty. In fact, I think they're mutually enfolded. Um, the reason, in order to have a rational argument at all, you're actually having constantly to appeal to the imagination. When we did a celebratory issue of the journal Theology for, for C.S. Lewis, which I was asked to guest edit, I, I, I wrote to Alistair McGrath, um, the, the, the um, theologian, and the idea was that he was going to write an article on C.S. Lewis's use of reason, and I was going to write an article on C.S. Lewis's use of imagination in apologetics. And talk about apologetics, we were keeping, kept ringing up to and apologize to each other, say, I'm sorry, I've had to say something about reason because the way, you know, that's all right, I've just noticed that, you know, all of his supposedly knocked down arguments don't really work as arguments, but they've got wonderful images that are really worth working with. So uh, real reasoning is enfolded with the imagination all the time, I think. And if you go back to earlier uses of the word reason, pre-enlightenment uses of the word reason, it seems to involve something much bigger than either the reductive or the purely deductive. It seems, for example, <coughs> to be uh, bound up with, starting with intu intuitive grasp of whole intellectual truth, from which you think, so famously, Augustine says, credo ut intelligam, I believe, in order to understand. So I think reason does need to become richer as imagination becomes richer. I don't think it's a zero-sum game. I don't think we have one battling against the other. I think because imagination was banished, reason has shriveled. But because imagination and reason were separated, imagination has done some terrible things. Some, I mean, I'm with Simon on this, that I mean, I'd, I'd like to be optimistic. But because I think that the world we perceive is in fact the world that we have together imaginatively shaped, it is possible for us to create something actually substantially hideous as a sort of echo chamber of what is unresolved and hideous in us. There's a real danger of that. And uh, imagination and reason are both poorer, weaker, and darker because they've been split apart. They both need, they need each other for recovery. 
And to echo uh, the point made by the question, uh, the lady, I think it was, about rationality <laughs> and Malcolm, Malcolm's view. Uh, and, and that is that, um, if I'm correct, we, 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 we don't think rationally, per se. I mean, we can use logic naturally, but uh, we think always in metaphors, we always think in analogies, and all my science is based on exactly that. And a story which, alas, I can't flesh out, so to speak, um, I read in Graham Farmlow's biography of Paul Dirac, or Dirac, if he's French, remember, um, is at one stage in his investigations, he had to invent this number to provide a sort of cosmological traction. And a similar argument being made in mathematics generally. But it seems to me there that obviously once this thing, like a complex number, exists, it obtains a rationality which can be applied in the most extraordinary way. But it itself is an invention. It's part of our imagination. And so, indeed, when I teach, one tries to give the students facts in a reasonably ordered fashion. Let's see whether, um, Jessica Marilyn, would you like to pick up on the true self, the meaning of I? Yeah. I think we, we don't think nearly enough about this. It, um, you know, when you change a job, you change identity. And I, I don't think we, we don't articulate it very well. Um, somebody I hugely respect once said, who will tell me who I am? And I think this is where the, the, the individual and the community have a real job to do, actually, t in reflecting who you are as a person. I mean, if you're depressed, you think of yourself in a completely different way from if you're very optimistic. And it, I, I think it may only be from outside that you can really find out who you are. Imagination, Imagination is perceiving things, feelings that are actually not present to the senses. It's an invention of the mind. What you can add to imagination is belief that it's true. And this is the power of placebo and nocebo, positive thinking, negative thinking, uh, ill-being, well-being, life view. There's an awful lot of evidence out there studying cohorts of individuals looking at the way they think determines how their life develops. So you can imagine, you know, angels and dragons or whatever, and that's not, so it's important to add to the power of imagination is the belief that it's true or could become true in the future. And we have, if we really want something to change for the human race, evolution of human consciousness, We've, we've got to really imagine how that's going to happen. I, I believe it needs huge education and somehow a return of the sense of belonging. I don't know how we're going to do that, but belonging is so important. I mean, in my model of consciousness of evolution, it gives belonging, meaning, and purpose to everything that exists in the cosmos. Belonging, meaning, and purpose comes from being connected to everything and serving a role to your high order structure to which you belong. But this, it's been brought up earlier today. We don't have a sense of our belonging. We should have, I mean, there's a lot of arguments about kin selection and group selection and so on, but in an evolution, biologically, we need to stay close to our families and our children are sort of going off into different countries or moving to different, and families are sort of falling apart. And then and the group selection, our tribe, we don't have a tribe we belong to. It, there's a sense of, of, you know, globalization has somehow wiped out belonging, which is a huge biological imperative in evolution. It's like belonging and being enclosed in that boundary of belonging to that organization, tribe, society, whatever. Inside that boundary, there's altruism and service and sacrifice and division of labor and love. The survival behaviors inside the boundaries. We have to know that we're still animals. We still have a biology, and between the boundaries, we've got our seven deadly sins. You've, 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 you've got, you, you, and we're still. That, that's that's a problem. Not belonging, as I said, we were talking about it before. We need to be invaded by some animals from a foreign planet. Eh? Is that you mean it's happened already? Oh, discuss. Uh, no, don't, don't answer the phone. If they ever ring up, say, just say we're busy or whatever. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, look, I'm going to begin to draw this session to a close, um, but I'm glad there are lots of questions, and please hold on to them and to the energy they represent and carry them into this afternoon, um, where I hope there'll be lots of time for them to flourish and develop. Let's just thank our panel, though, for what they've contributed this morning. Thank you. Thank you.